Internet, welcome back. It's been a long time. I, uh, I missed you too, don't worry. So uh, today we're gonna talk about business ideas and specifically how to come up with business ideas in a more consistent and sustainable fashion. Uh, I historically have sucked at this. Uh, for many years, I've struggled to come up with business ideas and I'm sure there's many reasons as to why that's the case. I've tried different methods and alternatives and I've never really hit anything that was, um, I would say, as effective as I would like it to be. So I recently came across a new framework uh, that's new to me um, from Sahil, who's the co-founder, no, actually the founder of Gumroad. And he specifically shared a framework and not just shared the framework, but actually created an entire lecture series around the topic. So if you take nothing else from this video, I highly recommend you just go to this specific lecture series and watch at least the first video where he talks around how to come up with business ideas. Um, in addition to that, in this series, he talks through a series of lessons of how to um, design, build, grow, and sell uh, that business idea that you've created. So this is highly recommended you watch. Um, in addition to that, I have um, this blog post that specifically covers this in detail from my perspective, from what I understood, both in his lecture series and also a book that he wrote called The Minimalist Entrepreneur. And in here, you have a bunch of links, details, videos, diagrams, etc. So I highly recommend going there. Before we start with the actual topic of the video, I have a newsletter and you should subscribe. So in this newsletter, um, I've written uh, roughly 30 iterations of this over 30 weeks. Um, there's three topics. So there's tech, there is uh, education, and then there's miscellaneous. So tech is gonna cover really basically anything related to tech that I find interesting. So that could be um, AI, different types of large language model discussions. It could be crypto, it could be nuclear fusion, it could be whatever I feel like that I come across that week. Um, education could be philosophy, physics, economics, finance, whatever else. And then lastly, miscellaneous could be random things that I think are interesting and are funny. So that could be um, images, movies, uh, video games, whatever else. So that's what the uh, newsletter is about. Highly recommend you subscribe. So with that being stated, uh, we'll get started. And before we actually jump right into that, I wanted to show this book here. Um, I highly recommend you read this if you're interested in kind of his philosophy around entrepreneurship. Um, entrepreneurship can be scary. Often when you think about entrepreneurship, you immediately default to Silicon Valley. You think about these big, massive, unicorn, billionaire, uh, billion dollar startups that need lots of VC funding and all that stuff. And in the end, this is a hindrance to many people where they're not necessarily eager or interested in building something that big um, and building something that's, you know, I guess that intimidating initially. And it's important to know that obviously not, not many people actually start their billion dollar companies thinking it's going to be one, um, some do. But the important thing here around the minimalist entrepreneur is actually keeping things small. And keeping them small, not necessarily in revenue, you wanna grow your revenue and make a lot of profits and, and, and make wealth and create wealth, um, but you don't necessarily want to expand your footprint of people and operations and the obligations you have to the business. Because in the end, the specific thing that Sahil talks about here and also many other people like Naval Ravikant and others, they all try to optimize for freedom. And to optimize for freedom, you basically always have to think about, think about when decisions come to you, is this going to increase or decrease my freedom? If not, then I need to make sure I kind of reevaluate the decision I'm making here and should I pursue this path. Um, in accordance to that point around freedom and leverage, I've written uh, another blog post recently um, all around leverage. So if you want to read about that and specifically around Paul Graham's and Naval Ravikant's perspective on that, I highly recommend that, that post. But with that being stated, um, let's get started with explaining the framework. So we're going to do something a little different um, today. And we're actually gonna draw. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how poor my skills are when it comes to drawing stuff. Like I said, there's alternative approaches. So one approach you may have come across is from an individual named uh, James Altucher. So we say James A. And the 10 ideas approach is basically to sit down and force yourself every single day to come up with 10 ideas. So these don't necessarily always have to be business ideas, but they have to be ideas. I did this approach with a few of my friends um, we did a 30-day challenge a few years ago, and this lasted the 30 days, and then after that, it stopped. Uh, for some reason, it just wasn't as effective as this framework is for me today. The other one is, uh, we'll call it an F list. So this is basically an irritation list or a frustration list. And this came from uh, a guy named Jack uh, Cornfield, I think. Um, he wrote a book called Chicken Soup for the Soul, and I came across this in another blog that I read on the topic of coming up with ideas. And this is a common piece of advice you see explained in different ways from different people. So frustration lists 
is basically walking around your, your life and experiencing your life day to day and writing down the things that frustrate you. Um, after you've written down the things that frustrate you, you then think to yourself, okay, can I solve this in some way with a service or a product? And then you start to try to think about ideas of solving your own personal problems. Um, the issue with these two, uh, these two approaches specifically is they're too general. And for me, I need something that's, uh, I would say, more prescriptive, at least to start with initially, something more specific. And that's exactly what Seahill provides here. So we'll first talk about the six major phases, and then we'll talk about the specific ideation phase. So we have uh, the have, which is basically having an idea, coming up with an idea. Next, we have the writing, which is writing a memo. Then we have design. We'll separate this. We have the build phase, we have the sell phase, and then we have the grow phase. So today we're probably gonna focus mainly on these two here. Uh, mostly the have phase, because that's what this video is about, is coming up with ideas. Um, but the lecture series that he, I showed you actually goes through all six of these, so you should definitely check that out. Um, the interesting thing about this, this phased approach and the articulation and specificity of what's needed for all of these is a point that Sahil makes in one of his lectures is if your goal is to actually create a business and be a solopreneur, then if you're not necessarily hitting on any of these items here throughout the time that you're working or however you're spending your time, you, you know that you're likely not progressing towards that end goal. It's binary. Either you're working on the business or you're not. And these are the very clear things that you can be doing to work on the business, preferably in the order that they're, they're listed here. One thing I'll kind of expand on is the have section. So prior to the have, we talked about community, right? So let's go down here, to talk more about that. So with community, you have different phases in your life of communities that you're a part of. And this is something that actually um, Alex uh, Hormezi expanded on, where he talked about there's three different types of communities. So there's your community that you've adopted or kind of uh, have been placed on to you by your parents. Um, next one is your younger years. And then the one after that is your current, uh, your current life. Now, all three of these are communities that you have either been a part of or are currently a part of or maybe even you aspire to be a part of. That could be kind of like current slash future. And it's important to you to think about what communities am I a part of currently? And also what communities have I been a part of that I feel like I understand a good, I have a good understanding and grasp of the problems that they have. And understanding the activities and problems that these communities have will help you structure and understand how to create businesses based off of those problems. So this is um, an important thing to think about. Another thing to consider is that maybe you don't necessarily have a clear understanding of communities you're a part of. Maybe you just don't have communities you're a part of. If that's the case, then you should, that's the first step, right? Join a community. Um, not just join a community, but Sahil talks about first joining, and this goes into his book, first joining a community and then actually contributing to a community. And this contributing piece is very important. Um, contributing in two ways, either making comments uh, on different forms or actually creating. And that's what I'm doing right now, creating a video and sharing it with you, a community. And the reason we want to uh, be a part of the community and actually comment and contribute and create is it's going to create a, um, a persona, a person that you start to build trust with and trust in between others and yourself. And this uh, trust and these relationships you build in your community is actually going to help you down the road when you want to get feedback, quality feedback on the products you want to sell to that community. Um, so that's definitely an important piece before we actually get into any of this stuff up here in these six phases is actually either joining a community, reflecting on the ones you're already a part of, and or contributing to those ones you've joined or already a part of as well. All right, now let's jump right into the ideation phase. So the have phase, this is where we're going to have ideas. So we can break this into a few different columns. And I'm so proud of my drawing skills right now. I'm sure my mother, my mom will be as well. All right. So at the beginning, we have who, we have what, this is going to be activities. We have another what, which is going to be problems. And then we have a solution. 
And then we have over here a business model. We'll add another box there. So we uh, go back to the community phase. So who is referring to who we're ser serving. And specifically for the who section, we want to be very specific. The more specific, the better. So remember, when you're doing the who section, you want to be specific. And an example here would be, um, maybe we have a general example would be people that are interested in longevity science. That's kind of generalized longevity area. A more specific one is saying, maybe we have people that are adamant about being centenarian decathlon athletes where they've read the Outlive book from Peter Tia, they followed a lot of his podcasts and they say, okay, I wanna adjust my routine, my eating regimen and the way that I live my life to ensure that when I'm 90 years old, I can do pull-ups and push-ups or whatever the decathlon consists of as a centenarian or a hundred year old. So that example could be here saying, uh, we wanna be a centenarian decathlon athletes. And then in this who section, we want to basically list out a bunch of communities that we're a part of and that we care about and we're interested in. So another one could be podcasts, uh, listeners, and maybe we want something more specific than just that because this is kind of general. So maybe we say podcast listeners that are um, consistently active uh, when listening to podcasts. So we, we're never uh, in a, in a state, stasis state when we're listening to a podcast. We're always moving and doing something. Uh, another one could be uh, cinema fans people that not only like to watch movies, but they like to watch movies in the cinema. So these are the different types of who's and, and communities you could be a part of. Next, after you have your who's, then you break these down, and this is what I've done for my own exercises, is where I break down each of these. So I'll start with uh, the Centenary Decathlon athletes, and then I'll fill out all my, um, what activities they do, and then I'll do all the problems, solutions, and business models, and then we'll go to the next one podcast. Then we'll go to the next one, cinema fans. We basically iterate over this over and over and over. And at the end, you should have probably 15 to 20 ideas, um, most of which will suck. And that's the part of that's a really important part of this is it's about quantity, not quality, because quality comes with quantity. The more ideas we come up with, the more times we iterate through this process, the more um, high quality ideas we'll get to because we've gone through the process of coming up with ideas. But more importantly, we've gone to the process of vetting the ideas and figuring out what actually resonates with the customers we're trying to serve. So think about this as a quantity exercise. Don't judge yourself. And that's another thing here is when you're going through this process here, we should be in a mindset of expansion. So this is an expansive mindset where we're thinking about how many ideas can we come up with and putting it all on paper, not judging the ideas. That's not, that's not this point in the phase. That's the next phase when we start to vet the ideas, but not now. So be expansive in your mindset. And as we're advancing through each one of these columns, some people might get hung up in this connection phase here where maybe we have a list of problems, say two, three, four problems, and then we're struggling to come up with solutions for these problems. Well, this is another area where Sahil jumped in and provided another framework. And this framework specifically revolves around um, economic forms of utility. So we have uh, different, we have four of them. So we have form, we have place, time, and then possession. And you can think of this as a quadrant. And in here, uh, I kind of simplified these so I can understand them better because when you kind of read through Wikipedia and stuff, it takes a little bit of grokking to understand specifically what this means in the context of creating a business and or a solution that solves a problem. And the way I think about this is time is simply just saving time. So you're saving somebody's time with a solution. Places you're actually bringing something closer to them. So physically or digitally. Form is just something that's more useful than it used to be. And then possession is something that's usually cheaper. And more context here. So place is bringing it closer. So that could be basically bringing a restaurant from New York to your small town. Maybe in New York, they have a really cool like fusion Indian um, Japanese restaurant that you're like, oh, I think a lot of people in my town would love that. So I'm going to port that over here. I'm going to bring it closer to them. That's the form of utility you're adopting. Um, time is you're simply just saving people time. It's pretty obvious. Uh, possession is around uh, something that's cheaper. So say, uh, Tesla had the uh, really fancy model, I think it was Model S or something like that, but it was a very fancy car that they started with and it was super expensive, the only wealth they could afford. But as economy scale kicked in and they could create more cars at, at, at a higher mass and a higher uh, throughput, they could actually lower the cost. And that then gave um, possession to more people because they lowered that it was a cheaper um, car. And then last one is more useful. So that's just making something that's old and, uh, and transforming it to make it new. So there's a lot of existing businesses that we can actually copy and paste and just improve 
um, by improving the operations and processes sitting in the back end through technology to make those things cheaper and or just better when it comes to the user experience. So those are the different forms of utility. So when you're thinking about these problems, you want to say, okay, can I kind of take any of these forms of utility and apply it to those problems? Um, another way of thinking about the forms of utility are at least three questions that prompt this thought process are saying, um, am I saving time? Am I saving money? Or am I making money? And this is all for the customer. So am I either saving the customer time? Am I saving the customer money? Or am I making the customer money? And these are all questions that you can say, okay, I have problem one here. So in what way can I either save time, make money, or save money for this person that has this problem? And you then port that over to a solution. And that actually makes this bridging the gap between these two columns much easier. One last um, item I want to call out here when it comes to bridging the gap between those two is actually targeting existing companies. So like I said, a lot of existing companies today tend to still have old processes and they're not necessarily adopting technology the way they should. And that opens up the opportunity for you as an entrepreneur to create that business where you're located to actually take more market share and make a profitable business. So we can think of this as kind of like an X, Y axis. And we have our existing business sitting in this vector space. And if we move this business in a multitude of directions, we can actually uh, you know, capture more market share. So there's different vectors we can move this on. So one vector is we can move it on money. Another vector is we can move it on time. That's a little clock. And the other one is place. We'll just do a P for place. And this goes back to the, the forms of economic utility I just referenced. So we can either uh, reduce the time it takes for this thing to happen, saving the customer time. We can either lower the cost, save the customer money, or we can actually remove it physically or digitally to that uh, customer to shift the place. And that's what we're doing with this node. We're moving it around on the vector space. And we're moving that existing company from one place to the other to actually take market share from them. So these are just different ways to think about how you can bridge the gap between these two columns and making it easier to actually um, transfer the problem to the solution. And the last thing I'll touch on here, I think it's the last thing, is business models. So we can actually do a little zoom in here. I don't know what it's going to look like on the video. Uh, okay, maybe we don't zoom in. We'll just keep it as is. Um, so there's different types of business models that you can adopt. And there's a lot of different like outlier cases that are kind of strange when it comes to business models. But we'll focus on the main business models that you're commonly going to see. So. First, you've probably heard of SaaS. So this is some sort of subscription service. So think uh, Netflix. Subscription. So Netflix, you subscribe monthly and you pay a certain amount and you get access to movies. The service they're providing to you is entertainment. You're paying them on a monthly basis. Next is, and actually one point here is this is a reoccurring purchase. So you're paying them monthly. It's a reoccurring revenue that they're getting in. The next one is a one-time purchase. So this can be either digital, let's do D, or physical for P. Example here is uh, iPhone. You buy an iPhone and you get uh, you get that physical product, and that's one-time purchase. Um, a digital purchase could be I buy a book on Kindle, and that's a that's a a digital one-time purchase. So another thing here is marketplaces. So marketplaces usually take some sort of um, fee. So they'll take uh, some sort of percentage cut of the fee from either the provider, the supply side, or the consumer, the demand side. An example here could be Airbnb. So we have Airbnbs where we have a person that's providing the home and the person that's purchasing the time to stay in the home. And the person that's providing the home and the time to stay in it, um, they're actually selling it for a certain price and the Airbnb platform is actually taking a cut of that fee when they provide that, uh, that distribution for the provider of the home. And then the last one here is going to be services. And services could be a variety of things. So it could be, say, events. It could be ongoing courses. Uh, what else? It could be consulting, uh, freelance, can't write. All right, so it could be a variety of things here. And these are services that we're gonna provide usually for our time. So we're equating our time for some sort of thing that somebody can purchase based off of what we're providing. So these are some of the main business models that you can actually map your solutions and products to. Okay, so now that we've talked through the framework of how to have ideas, um, let's go and talk a bit about how to think about what makes a, um, a better idea. 
So there's a, a subset of nuances here that Sahil talked about that kind of helps us understand that. So first is trends. So our business, ideally we want to ride trends. If we can ride macro trends, that's going to actually provide a market pool where we're not necessarily having to push a boulder up the hill. We can either push it on a neutral ground plane or we can actually push it down, uh, down a slope and make it easier on ourselves. And the reason we want to do that is it increases the likelihood of our business succeeding because we're being pushed by this macro trend or pulled by the market. Some examples here could be uh, moving an offline thing to an online thing. Uh, another one could be moving from manual to automated or from desktop to cloud or from code to no code. There's a variety of things that we can kind of ride these macro trends and there's many more. These are just some examples. So uh, offline to online. So we're moving basically, um, say, grabbing a taxi cab uh, with our hand to grabbing an Uber with our phone. That's going from offline to online. Manual to automated. This is basically every existing business that's maybe exceeding 20 years old or 30 years old. We can just copy and paste that business and automate many of the processes and operations in the back end and also the consumer experience to provide it uh, at a cheaper uh, level and also at a higher quality. So that's just basically automating manual tasks. Next one, desktop to cloud. This is like the whole cloud movement. So basically moving desktop things to the cloud. Um, and last is code, code to no code. So this is basically trying to transfer um, and adopt new methods of actually uh, being able to code uh, in different ways where we're not necessarily doing it ourselves as developers, but um, having other users do that. So a lot of people don't necessarily know how to code, but want to build things and applications. And they may use Notion, Airtable, um, Bubble, MakerPad, a whole bunch of different types of software that enable this, this process. So jumping onto that trend can help as well. And uh, as a business, this is another um, Sahil, Sahil-ism that, uh, that I came across that I really enjoyed, which is thinking about your business as an arrow. And as this arrow is flying through the air, you want the arrow to intersect with as many trends and as many economic forms of utility as possible. So you're not only increasing your likelihood of success from trends, but also utility forms as well. So let's, uh, let's give this a shot. Let's draw a crooked arrow. Let's draw a straighter arrow. There we go. And draw some cool feathers on that arrow. And then we have uh, little slivers of things. And these slivers of things could be trend one. This, this could be trend two, uh, utility form one and utility form two. And our goal is to make sure that our business, do B for business, is intersecting as many of those things as possible as we create it over time. Because like I said, that's going to create more traction and it's going to create kind of a flywheel effect that Amazon talks about where it's not necessarily a flywheel here, but it's, it's helping you progress that business in a more uh, uh, frictionless uh, way. Another thing we want to talk about here when it comes to ideas is actually trying to contemplate two competing ideas. So say we have uh, idea, let's do idea one and idea two. And both of these ideas are competing in your head where you have a long list of ideas and you have these two ideas you're really excited about, but you don't know which one to choose. Um, well, Sahil provides a few heuristics that you can use to think through, is this a good idea that I should pursue or not? So the first one here is going to be, uh, is it fast to build? To build, not build. All right, so which one is faster to build? Because remember, we're trying to, 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 move, to move quickly, to keep it minimalist, to be right, to get to market and get feedback as fast as possible to see if this idea is actually worthy of spending your time on because people are willing to pay for it. So how fast can I build it? Next is, is this a 10x or is this a 3x idea? We always want to favor 10x. So this deserves some explanation. And the way that this, he talks about 10x and 3x is say we have a group of 100 people and we send both ideas to this group of 100 people. Say idea one, you have maybe 10 people that are 10x excited about this idea. That means that they're super pumped about it, they're willing to pay for it right now, and they feel like this thing that you're providing them is, is providing so much value that they're willing to pay for it right now, even though it doesn't exist. You can take my money now and give me the product later. Um, the other one is say you have 60 of the 100 that are 3x excited. So this is more like, you know, meh. This is, it's an okay thing. I'm not sure if I'd buy it. It seems interesting, but you know, I'm, I'm still on the fence. That's kind of a 3x, 3x excited. It may change and improve their lives, but not to the point where they're actually willing to pay for it or be extravagantly excited about it right now. In that case, we should always try to go for 10x. So the next one here is going to be B2B or B2C. 
Um, this one is basically, if possible, choose B2B. Reason we want to go for B2B is that we can sell our products usually for a higher price because companies tend to have more money than individuals. And then also we want to uh, have an easier way of selling our product. So usually B2B, there is a, um, it's, it's a little bit easier to sell. The sales process, the sales cycle and process can be longer depending on the types of business you're selling to, but it's usually an easier sell. Um, for B2C, if you do pursue this path, try to go after wealthier individuals. So that's either people that are older or people that are um, well off from investments or whatever else. That's kind of what you want to think about with your ideas there. Uh, the next one here is going to be, which one's most fun for you? And this one's pretty, pretty important because think about, you're probably going to spend at least five plus years on this company, working on it. And you probably want to make sure that if you're going to spend five years on something, it's a community that you truly enjoy and truly being, enjoy being a part of. So you want to think about what's most fun for me and do I want to spend my time providing value to this community? And then last one is co-founders. So maybe one idea has uh, a co-founder and the other one doesn't. And maybe the one that has a co-founder is somebody that you're extremely excited about working with because they have a skill that you lack or they're um, admirable in some way. So you want to work with them on idea one instead of idea two that has no co-founder. That's another variable that comes into play. So these are just different things, heuristics that you can think about of saying, you know, does idea one or two hit any of these? And if so, does that kind of sway my opinion of doing this thing? And then the last thing I want to call out for ideas is say that we're going through this process here in this diagram. And as we're going through this process, we're progressing, we're progressing, we're progressing. There's an idea that we came up with, say back here. And this idea is really stuck in our head. We can't stop thinking about it. Even though we're progressing through all these phases, we keep thinking back to this idea that that's just, we just can't stop thinking about it. Um, one of the points he makes here is that if that is the case, then what he recommends is actually just build it. Go through the process, you know, go through the process of not just to have, but go back up to here and move forward. Write your memo, design the product, even start building it if you need to. And the reason he says that is that if there's something truly you're truly excited about, it's important for you to go through this process and actually start vetting the idea because most likely you're going to realize it's a bad idea. Because when you get to the writing phase here, he said roughly 95% of his ideas actually get thrown out during the writing phase. And that's when you're writing a memo about the product. So what's the, what's the problem, what's the solution, and what's the marketplace you're trying to pursue? And this isn't a video to talk about that. I recommend his lectures for that. But this process really helps you kind of distill and articulate your thoughts on the idea you had in the have phase. And then it helps you vet those. And the 5% that passed this phase, the design phase, you know that they're, they're more likely worth your time than the other 95 that didn't. All right. And now there's two more things I want to talk about here. So the next thing is around time constraints. And this is something I really appreciated uh, when I, when I kind of listened to him talk about it and explain the importance of this process and why time constraints actually matter. So let's say that we force ourselves to write our memo, design our product and build our product, then launch our product within a single weekend, like a hackathon. So here we have, uh, this is going to be Monday, this will be Sunday, Saturday, Friday. So prior to Friday, likely we've had a series of ideas. So maybe we've worked through the half process that I've discussed above. And in the half process, we came up with an idea that we actually wanna to try to write a memo on. So say we have our idea prior during the week, and then now it's getting to Friday evening. And what we're gonna do here on Friday evening is we're actually gonna write our memo, and we might even start designing our product after we've written our memo. Because we've written the memo, we're still convinced that this is a good idea that we should try out. So we start designing, and then Saturday we start building. And Sunday we build, and Monday, the most important day, is we launch. Spelled launch wrong. Let's do this correctly. Launch, and add our box back. All right, so the reason we're creating these time constraints, and the reason we're shoving everything into a single weekend is Two things. One is procrastination. And I'm writing fast, so I might misspell some stuff. And then the other one is uh, scope creep. Both of which I felt the pain of. So procrastination is maybe you actually don't want to necessarily jump in the idea yet, or you're putting off building it or launching it because of X reasons. Maybe you will need to read more books on the topic. Maybe you need to reach out to more people, whatever it is. And you're really kind of slowing yourself down because you're procrastinating, putting it off. 
you're letting um, perfect be the enemy of enough or good or something like that. And then scope creep is maybe your product or solution. You have a ton of features. You have this grand vision of what this thing should look like. And in the end, um, this grand vision is holding you back from actually doing anything with the, with the idea in the first place. And that is the uh, antithesis of the minimalist entrepreneur. So we're not going for that. We're going for the minimalist entrepreneur approach here. So we want to actually start cutting features. So maybe we have, you know, four features we want to get out. But of these four features, only one is actually core to what this product or solution does. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on that one solution, that one, that one feature, the core piece throughout Saturday and Sunday to build this so we can launch on Monday. Everything else gets cut. We cut it for now initially so we can launch, but we can then build it in the future. And the reason we're constraining ourselves are these two reasons here. Also, we want to get feedback. We're probably going to get feedback on multiple phases. So one area we're going to get feedback on is going to be the memo. So we're going to seek feedback from the memo. We're also going to seek feedback from the design because we're probably going to use a product like Figma so we can actually have an interactive prototype we can send to people so they can interact with it and see like how the flow works. And then also we're going to obviously get feedback on launch. And then we're getting feedback on launch. Most importantly, we want to be asking for money. We want to get money from these people. Either we set up a buy button that actually doesn't take their card or it takes their card and we re reimburse the money right after or whatever that is. But we try to get them to exchange money for the product we have because that in itself has the most conviction of anything. Even if someone tells you you're going to buy something, they're likely not going to buy it unless they actually buy it. So that's, that's really a key piece here. And then after all that, the last thing I'll leave you with is the checklist that Sahil talks through. And this checklist is something that runs through Sahil's mind every time he's working on a product and or idea and it's something that we should think through as well. So first and foremost, is this product idea going to be profitable? Not only profitable, but profitable soon. Because remember, we're not taking VC capital, we're not taking venture capital firms uh, money, we're not getting investment from anything else, we're bootstrapping this from the ground up. So we need to get money in soon rather than later so we can actually fund the rest of this business. So we want to get profitable soon. Is this idea profitable soon? This kind of leads into the B2B stuff and a bunch of other things we already discussed. The next one is, is it possible to grow organically? And the example he provided here was Gumroad. And with Gumroad, specifically, uh, it's a product that allows you to buy uh, digital assets from usually creators. So if I create art, books, courses, videos, whatever else, I can send you a Gumroad link that then allows you to purchase the product I want to sell you. And when I send you the Gumroad link as a creator, you're automatically organically growing the product itself because you're sharing things with others for them to interact with it. And that then spreads through word of mouth and interaction what Gumroad is and how it works. And then that then eventually gets more customers as well. That's another thing you want to think about is, is this idea uh, has the ability to grow organically or can I tack that onto this idea already? Next one is, can I build it? So there's some caveats with this. So can I build it? So if you're, say, an artist and you do graphic design, and one day you want to transition and do nuclear fusion, that's a big jump going from graphic design to nuclear fusion. So that's um, a big jump that you kind of want to contemplate and say, maybe this isn't something I can, I can do. I need more either money or, 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 or participants or time or whatever else. This is the question I want to answer at least immediately. So maybe that's not necessarily a good idea for you to start now. But most ideas are, as long as they're not massive kind of hard science problems or anything else that you don't necessarily have the expertise in doing yourself. Um, another caveat I want to add here is that if you're not a developer, it doesn't mean you can't do something in the digital realm. Um, like I said, there's a lot of no-code tools that you can use. So um, first off, use the no-code tools to build your products if you need to, but also know that you can learn on the job. Learn on the job. And another really important part about this with learning on a job is not being discouraged by the fact that you can't necessarily, you don't have developer skills to build this thing now. In addition to that, there's one other quote that I wanted to call out here is it's kind of a motto for his book, The Minimalist Entrepreneur. And it basically says, start, then learn. And this really resonated with me because I tend to be the opposite. I tend to focus heavily on the learn side and do a lot of reading of books and lectures and courses, et cetera, et cetera, but very rarely do I start. And his approach is saying you need to start and then you need to learn. And this actually is another thing that um, I think Alex Hormezi talks about as well, 
where it where he states that um, if you start and then you try to learn theory later, you actually have a lattice network to hang your understanding on. So you have more context, which makes the learning more effective because you've already tried to do something and you've gone back and tried to learn it yourself. So this is ne this is definitely a really good quote to kind of think through and a model to reiterate to yourself. And then the last one we're going to talk through is going to be uh, will I love it? And this one goes back to the point we made earlier. And that goes back to the idea of if I'm going to work on to this, I'm going to work on this for five years, then I definitely should know and understand that I want to provide value to this community for a long time. So is this something that I'll love and uh, something that I'll care about for the long term? So with that being stated, um, that's a lot of information. I hope this is useful. Uh, internet, I appreciate you watching the video and I will see you in the next one. Don't forget my newsletter. Subscribe. Subscribe to it right now.